You'd think after spending thousands of hours across some of the greatest games of all time, we'd have seen everything developers have to offer. And maybe some of us have, but that's where fan theories come in. The idea that some narrative elements, characters and worlds actually had more to them is just plain cool, and some of the best ways to experience video games is through the lens of a fan. In many cases, these potential alternate realities could actually be true as well. And with that in mind, I'm Scott from Oculture.com and these are 10 jaw-dropping video game fan theories that make everything better. Number 10, the world of Pokemon is ravaged by war. Pokemon red, blue, and yellow. It might seem a bit strange that the joyously animated Pokemon could have been privy to a population destroying war, but you only need to take stock of a few things before it starts making sense. First up, there's the fact that your character's father is never addressed whatsoever. Instead, your rival Gary, or whichever name you gave him, I went with Knobface, is an orphan who also never gets a background story either. In addition, you'll notice when exploring Kanto that there are a huge amount of gyms and hospitals throughout such a very small area Area, with a distinct lack of males aside from gym leaders or military personnel. For the latter, listen to Lieutenant Search, who actually claims that electric Pokemon saved him during the war. Number 9, Metal Gear Solid 3's Time Paradox Explained from a man who shoots bees out of his fingertips to another who can channel electricity, many fans thought Metal Gear Solid 3's ridiculous stylings were just a bit too much. So what if it was all a VR simulation? What if we were never actually embodying 1970s Naked Snake and instead a modern day Solid Snake? The evidence is subtle, but enough of it is there if you want to believe. Remember if you failed a mission in a specific way, you'd get one of those time paradox alerts? You'd even hear Colonel Campbell's voice shouting to mention you've done it wrong, despite the fact he's not even in the game. This could easily be him shouting at Snake as he's jacked into some future machine, the likes of which might exist in Metal Gear Solid 4's world. Secondly, at the very start of the game, we have Major Zero mentioning to Snake about the codename of the mission being the Virtuous Mission, to which Snake mishears as the Virtual Mission. It's a tiny detail, but considering Kojima likes to treat the fourth wall like Tony Bone does subtlety, chances are this is something he wanted us to ponder over forevermore. Number 8, The X-Corp is a Ghost, Max Payne 3. In a hark back to the Devil Man in Red Dead Redemption, Max Payne 3 also features a figure that many believe to be something of a ghost, or a figment of Max's imagination. Called Anders Deadling, he's a relatively happy and family-loving ex-cop, and this guy turns up a few times in the main game story. However, even during a firefight, he locks himself inside a toilet cubicle, but when you open it, there's nobody inside. Throughout the game, Max is already in a very bad way, drinking heavily and taking large amounts of medication. So it's not too much of a stretch to imagine him talking to a version of himself that could have existed had the events of the first two games not driven him to the brink of death. Number 7, Shepard was being controlled from the start, Mass Effect. We all know about the indoctrination theory in regards to Mass Effect 3's god-awful ending, but what about the idea that Shepard never fully recovered their full sanity following the Prothean Beacon run-in on Eden Prime? It seems like something of a reach being that very action is the thing that kickstarts some major events in the trilogy, but hear me out. First up, many will remember conversations with other aliens that have been indoctrinated in the original game and how they describe the noises in their head as being a scraping sound, alongside whispering being buried underneath. Well, if you listen carefully, that's exactly the same as what can be heard during Shepard's first trip, leading to the idea that he only believed what he was seeing because he was being indoctrinated by the Protheans. To be honest, when you think about it, the very idea that Shepard, a militaristic individual regardless of your choice of origin, would just believe some crazy blur of imagery right in front of him is a bit suspect, and the idea of your actions being controlled by the Protheans as a planted motivation to take down the Reapers turns everything on its head. Number 6, explaining the Animus conversations, Assassin's Creed. Did you ever play Assassin's Creed and just after taking down your target as you're chatting away to them, you wonder, wait a minute, why the hell is the world around me completely stopped? How am I able to have a full conversation with a dying person when just a few seconds ago I shot them from on top of a roof or I'd ram through their kidneys with my blades? Well, being that we're already in a virtual simulation, it's mostly believed that these scenes are the Animus machine pausing the world or establishing a connection between the user and the victim. The problem is that this specific element of the game's premise is never fully explored or explained. So what if these conversations never really happened? If we take the idea of the bleeding effect, where abilities transfer from the person being watched to the user in the Animus and run with it, we know the machine can somehow harness DNA and transfer it to someone like Desmond. This fan theory purports that because of this ability, the Animus is recreating these conversations for the user alone, even though they didn't actually happen. Based purely off the idea of two people coming into contact with each other, DNA is transferred and stored between each person in any given scenario. And of course, it helps that in this case, it's between two assassins. Number 5, you're the villain, Limbo. The most obvious theory about Limbo is that the game itself is the protagonist's version of Purgatory, an idea supported by the fact that the game's final area mimics that of the opening, and as both the ending and intro contain fadeouts out and in from darkness. 
It's fairly easy to connect them together this way, but a more enticing theory is that the boy is actually the villain. Just look at the way he kills the spider boss, ripping its legs off before rolling the body through the woods to progress. In addition, we could say that the spider only wanted to restrain our character, as it kind of acts as a guardian throughout this plane of existence, attempting to encase the boy in webbing at the start. What if the boy actually caused his sister's death, and his journey through the world is one of anger and lashing out? The other children you come across in the world flee from you at every turn. And going off the fact that the main menu shows two fly-covered graves, whatever happened to the boy and the girl before they ended up in limbo was definitely not pleasant. Number four, it's all one and the same, The Legend of Zelda. Although the major Mario games have remained fairly similar in their graphical stylings for going spin-offs like Paper Mario, Zelda has seen everything from the extremely cute minimalist aesthetic of Wind Waker all the way through to the realistic looking Twilight Princess. However, what if these striking graphical changes were the result of The Legend of Zelda being retold across different generations in different cultures? For example, when retelling campfire stories, part of the fun is embellishing certain aspects and exaggerating them for your audience. But the core must always remain the same. In this case, we always have a small magical boy on an adventure, wielding a sword and shield, wearing a tunic and fighting monsters. Lots of fans have different favorite games specifically because of these huge aesthetic differences, but with this perspective, it all comes together pretty damn nicely. Number three, James's true horror, Silent Hill 2. Not only was Silent Hill 2's atmosphere and art direction incredibly effective at conveying the dilapidated town of Silent Hill itself, but we also got one zinger of a plot twist along the way. In addition to the realization that you actually brought all of this on yourself after murdering your own wife and repressing the memory, many fans have assumed that as we never saw such a thing, the body of Mary must be nowhere near us throughout the game. A truly horrifying idea then, that was also later half confirmed by one of the team, Masahiro Ito, is that Mary's body was in the trunk of your car the entire time. Ito's twist on the popular theory was that it was actually in the back seat, only James couldn't see it due to his level of repression around his actions. Although the game does feature multiple endings, the in-water version has James state that now we can be together by driving into the lake and committing suicide. What this could really mean is that following the revelations throughout the game, he's now aware of where Mary really is, making that final resting place more important. Number two, Otacon imagines all the crazy stuff. Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes. One of the biggest differences between the original PS1 Metal Gear Solid and the remake is the direction of the cutscenes. Where before we had Snake take a rocket launcher to the roof of a tower to confront his brother who was inside a gunship, instead on the GameCube version, Liquid Snake actually shoots a rocket in Snake's direction to which he manages to backflip onto, only to launch himself back off and fire another missile back at Liquid Snake. It was a completely ludicrous scene, and fans of Metal Gear Solid 1's slightly more realistic, quote unquote, physics were utterly put off. However, the saving grace is that thanks to a certain fan theory focusing on how much Otacon idolizes Snake, the whole thing is actually him imagining how the battle played out, based on his interaction with Snake and the way the scenes are introduced and edited. There's no other information to support this other than fans want to believe it, but hey, it definitely makes everything okay again, at least until the next ridiculous thing happens and Otacon's nowhere to be found. Number 1. Aerith Wasn't Supposed to Die, Final Fantasy VII Remember that artwork inside the Final Fantasy VII instruction booklet with Aerith looking up at the flying ship Highwind? That never actually happens in the game, but why is that? Could it be that the life scar of an entire generation, the moment that changed evil villain Sephiroth from a total badass to someone who just had to be stopped, wasn't actually part of the game in the first place? As has been compiled in many places online, there's a multitude of evidence that points to the idea that everyone's favorite ancient was supposed to remain a part of your team all the way through. From things like the final battle area having an empty stone section where Aerith could have stood, to a certain conversation with Tifa mentioning how she was convinced Aerith would return, it seems like the decision to kill her off was added after the majority of the rest of the game was completed. The aforementioned scene with the high wind is sketched out in the instruction booklet, giving away that maybe she was going to go all Gandalf the Grey on us and emerge resurrected all along. We can only imagine. 